Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. This is Tim Erlen. I'm the Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Tony Sager, Senior Vice President and Chief Evangelist at CIS. Uh, although we were, we were just discussing that uh, his title might be better as Chief Storyteller. So we're very excited to have Tony here. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. And uh, Tony, you've got a, a long history in cybersecurity, not just at CIS. So you're, you're bringing a, a ton of experience to this conversation, which is part of what makes it so exciting. Yeah, thanks very much. I was, um, yeah, I'm at about 44 years, I think, now and counting, most of it in federal service at the National Security Agency. And uh, I'd love to tell you that many decades ago, I figured out this would be the hot career as I got to the end of my working days, but uh, that wouldn't be true. I just happened to be you know, the right person in the right place at the right time and got to ride the wave that we call cybersecurity today. Well, and it's a, it's a, you know, an industry that, that continues to change in interesting ways. I've, I've always said that whenever I think it might be time to, to leave, something interesting happens and it, it keeps me here. <laughs> yeah. If that's great, that's your criteria, you'll probably never get to leave Tim. Well, that's okay. I can live with that. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, we're, we're here to talk, uh, about, um, the way that this COVID-19 pandemic is, is changing the information security landscape. Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously a world event that, that we can't ignore. It impacts, um, you know, every industry and, and frankly, every person. But for information security specifically, um, we're going to chat a little bit about the, the impact and, and, um, how organizations are, um, adjusting and, um, adapting to the new environment, um, that we're working in. So from your, your perspective at, at CIS, what, what kind of changes are you say, seeing in the, the cybersecurity market or the cybersecurity industry as a, a result of the, the pandemic? Uh, yeah, great question, Tim. I mean, we're, you know, we're both observers and we're participants. So we're, uh, you know, a small but mighty uh, technology company, a little nonprofit and, you know, a pretty traditional office environment with a, a small percentage of people working from home uh, scattered around the country. And uh, almost overnight, maybe a long weekend or so, we find ourselves as a hundred percent remote workforce. So uh, a lot of things happened in a hurry. Um, most successfully, I'm, I'm happy to say, and most because uh, not, not of what we did over the weekend, which was a pretty amazing uh, bit of work, but also the, the prior year or two in uh, better structuring our entire IT infrastructure and um, building more capacity, uh, you know, b b t turning from um, anyone outside the headquarters was a lost orphan with their shadow IT. We put in place a lot of uh, really cloud-based and much more scalable solutions for the entire company, no matter where they happen to work. So we, you know, we hit it, hit it pretty well and, and got really lucky. But yeah, we've seen a lot, obviously, uh, shifting overnight and uh, a lot of folks facing up to, you know, I'll call them the classic challenges. You know, it's, it's been a truism for probably a, a decade or more, right? The perimeter is gone and, you know, so forth. And this really makes you face up to it when, when literally over days and weeks, you're, you're moving all your folks outside the building and then realizing many of them can't do their work unless they have access to resources that are back inside the building. Actually, my, my daughter works for the Federal Reserve of New York and uh, faced exactly that where the nature of her work meant access to lots of information. And so when she got moved to work from home, you know, a lot of her work was really difficult to pull off. And so a lot of adjusting and a lot of rethinking uh, and sort of thinking about, wait, wait a minute, where is our information? Where is the, where are the, the vital things that we depend upon and we would rather the world not know? And how do we make that available to employees? So really a rapid shift, uh, you know, and, it, it, you know, conceptually, maybe it wasn't a surprise. We've been saying these kinds of things for quite some years. But as a practical matter, you know, really a, a struggle to, to put in place the uh, the kind of um, uh, flexibility and capacity that we would really need to support a very very large scale work from home pro uh, program. Yeah, it's uh, I mean it's easy to it's one thing to say that that there's no perimeter any anymore, and it's a it's another entirely to suddenly be forced to actually not have a perimeter. Um, I think a lot of organizations have have gone through that that transition in this in this time period. It's very challenging. 
Yeah, I used to uh, talk about you know my days in government, you know, uh, you know, three and a half decades there, and I said our, our our security model was implicitly built upon around control, you know, control of human beings and control of assets, right? And you know, you had a security clearance or you didn't. You're one of our trusted suppliers or you're not. It's sort of a binary decision, right? And um, you know that that hasn't been true for quite some time. I mean, we're now in this. You know, much more complicated world where, and, and it's reflected in traditional security programs where, where you'd say, well, you know, here's a set of requirements and you should do this careful analysis of exactly where your, all your IT is and all your information assets. And, you know, we make a decision about the risks there. And, you know, we don't get the opportunities for that sort of careful analysis, right? Things are just happening too fast and it's dispersed across large fronts. So you have to be, both looking really broadly at, at all these different problems, but also very focused on well, what really matters, right? Everything can't be equally important. So how do we focus in our attention and our controls and our, you know, management attention on things that are really, really vital to the future of the company? And, you know, we, we again, we, we've talked for years about doing that, but I think this really brings it home for us. Yeah, it, it brings to mind the, the, for me at least, you know, the difference between building building security in at the start uh, as part of a you know an application or a service and adding it as an afterthought where organizations for which you know security was part of their their DNA for lack of a you know a better metaphor it, they would have looked at this expansion of of working from home and, and security would have been part of the architecture that they 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 looked at regardless mm -hmm. and organizations that think of it as an afterthought uh, you know they'd be figuring out how to apply security controls after the you know the horses left the barn so to speak yeah that's that's exactly right Tim I think you know it Towards the end of my career at, at NSA, uh, there was the time of uh, Cyber Command starting up. And so a lot of new folks in the business, I used to say there's a, a thousand cyber warriors running around who could barely spell IT. You know, it was very new and very confusing. And I remember one senior officer made a comment that said, um, you know, and, and she thought that we were horribly misguided in the DOD because we were trying to protect everything, which wasn't actually true, but it was kind of the way she thought of it, and therefore we're not protecting the most important thing. And, and I offered a, you know, a different way to think about it, which is, you know, everything deserves some level of protection, but some deserve more because, you know, any risk analysis I ever saw that said, well, these assets aren't critical and these are not critical and so forth, uh, eventually turned out to be wrong. You know, things change, partners change, information moves. And so you can never assume that you're right. You know, we'd love to neatly partition sort of important from unimportant, critical from not critical, you know, mine from yours. But that's not, not realistic in, in the world today. And so, yeah, sort of thinking ahead of time, I, I need to have some level of visibility and control and you know, understanding and uh, so forth of, of all my assets, right? And I can't afford to protect everything at the highest level. That's a given. But if I think of it as, you know, some things are less important, well, that, that's what red teams go after, right? That's what it, that real adversaries go after, the things that you have decided are unimportant, but have some unexpected connection or dependency upon the rest of your enterprise. Well, so, I mean, that challenge of prioritization is, is not one that, that the industry has solved by any means. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how to prioritize remediation or how to, uh, you know, assign appropriate business value to assets, you know, with, with the point being that you then can prioritize remediation. But part of your point there is that even the assets you might deem as, as unimportant can have a, a high value in, in an attack chain. Yeah, that, that's, that's right, Tim. I think, you know, sort of classical, uh, thinking about computer security has, has always been sort of intellectually complete, but practically not very useful. That, that's just an opinion. <laughs> You're welcome to it. In, in this sense, right? The idea is that every, uh, every business is unique. Our dependencies are unique. And the, the term, the risk appetite of our managers is unique and our, so forth. And, uh, that the, there's, there's truth in all there, but it, it leads us down the path, what, what I call the special snowflake school of security, right? Everyone is unique. And therefore, you know, you, you really don't want to spend any money on defense until you figure out all this uniqueness and all these dependencies and so forth. And then you go to some giant catalog and you, you choose wisely from this catalog and you manage you know, to that set of controls. And in my view, that's that's not been uh, very scalable or successful, even for large federal agencies with, you know, with what you might think are very large budgets. You know, for me, and this is the approach that we take at CIS, is that there's sort of a, a large, you know, bad soup of bad things that we all have to deal with. Right. Conceptually, we're all on the same network using roughly the same technology, and we're all interlocked in these complicated and constantly changing business relationships, many of which we aren't even visible to us, right, through supply chains and so forth. 
And so, you know, our view is there's a, there's a large, from there, there's a large set of things that we all ought to worry about. But as a practical matter, most enterprises don't have the kind of threat information or the people and, and the time and the luxury of thinking about this. So our view is, you know, th there's just a set of things that we all ought to do, right, that are backed up by you know, an understanding of threats and technology and the business use of technology and so forth. But there's a set of things that we all ought to do. And if you start from there, and that's really the kind of philosophy behind things like the CIS benchmarks and the CIS critical security controls, then uh, you're, you're, you're doing things that you need to do anyway, but you don't need to spend a year thinking about it to get there. No, that's kind of the way we, we view that. Now, again, there are enterprises that face higher risk, that have better resources, all those kinds of things. And yes, they, they, they need to do more. But for the mainstream, you know, for the vast majority, uh, this is not about, you know, we, we, if we think of everyone as a special snowflake, then that sort of paralyzes everybody. That's just, you know, that's been our experience. And so, uh, and by the way, we, we take similar approaches in things like public health, and we're seeing that play out today, and mm -hmm. the safety of bridges, and is it safe to fly in a commercial plane, and all these, you know, society has a way of managing risks that are imperfect, but, but helpful, right? They let us make good, but not perfect decisions most of the time. And, but we don't ask everyone to become an expert in public health or in civil engineering and so forth. Well, I, I think that the key point you there is you said there is that that some organizations need to do more, which doesn't mean that they need to do different, but that the the basics still apply to those organizations, and they may need to do something in addition to those basics. But those those critical security controls, those fundamental security controls, are still applicable. Yeah, that that's that's been um, you know my experience, my observation, and we have we build that in essentially to the way we operate at CIS. You know that is. You know, my, when I first started speaking in public about these things, and which was a kind of an unusual turn for, you know, for someone who worked at the National Security Agency, this was in about 2001, uh, people started to ask me, uh, questions, you know, and I wasn't really prepared to be honest to, for, for these questions. They were things like, well, where, how do I get started? You know, what would mm -hmm. you do first? And, oh boy, that, this, here's a moment of personal confession for you. At that moment, I realized, hmm, I've had this great job for decades. All I have to do is point out other people's problems. I don't actually have to fix them, right? I have no responsibility because if you have responsibility to fix them, then those are the right questions, right? What, yeah. What's the most important thing? How do I get started, right? My boss doesn't have infinite patience. I only have a budget for so-and-so, you know, so these are the practical questions that, that people have to deal with. And wow. And my gut reaction was uh, visibility, you know, that it struck me that so many of the folks we dealt with in government, the DOD, the intelligence community, et cetera, didn't even have decent visibility into their own enterprise. Like, what do they actually have out there? And what, what state is it in, right? What state of configuration or level of patching and so forth? And, you know, I, I, I can say this with all humility. I'm, I'm one of the few lifelong, you know, multi-decade defenders who spent most of his professional life inside an intelligence agency, which is a great education. You get to see how other nations are attacked or how other nations are attacking us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's incredible insight and... You know, my observation from all that was, uh, hey, the professional folks that do that, right, that attack for a living, are really good at what they do, but they don't do magic. And mm -hmm. if you treat them as performing magic, you have no defense against magic. But if you mm -hmm. understand their trade craft, then you understand they have their own risk model, right? They don't like to be caught. They don't want to be observed, right? Because they put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of infrastructure into attacks. And so that, that gut reaction for me was about visibility, you know, that when people ask me those questions. And that gets translated into, you know, things that we recommend from CIS, because I think that's a principle that stands up pretty well, independent of the technology that you implemented it. And yeah. it's backed up by a marketplace. For example, you know, no, no schmooze implied, but the kind of things that you, you guys do are really around this sort of core functionality of visibility management, awareness of the state of security, right, as represented in things like configurations and so forth. So for me, that's a bedrock must do. Doesn't matter how exotic the attacker, how well funded they are, or how unfunded they are. This this is the foundation upon which you build better better and more complex and more nuanced defenses. And so, yeah, in, in a best case, right, you you ask kind of the mass market to do things that everyone ought to do. And then they are the foundation for more complex, more nuanced, you know, higher risk kind of activities. And I think that's, you know, that's a reasonable goal for us all.
You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So let, let's bring this back to the, the COVID-19 issue again, because, you know, we're talking a lot about these sort of fundamental basic security controls. Do you see that those controls changing in light of the, the way that organizations are, are fundamentally changing how their, how their workers connect and interact uh, in order to get their jobs done? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a, a, a fair observation and something we struggle with, you know, in the, in the ongoing uh, sustainment of the CIS controls and the benchmarks. You know, that is, we're always thinking, right? There, there's a challenge with any sort of security framework or guidance, et cetera. And uh, if you've looked at them over decades, you, you know, they, they range from what I would call the cosmic, you know, uh, uh, do, go, here, do, do good things and write me a paper that said you do good things down to the sort of microscopic, you know, you, you must install this technology and install Change this, this registry key. Exactly. And so, and there <laughs> yeah. are, there's a place for all those. The, the problem is, you know, the, 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 the usual problems apply, right? If, if you're too uh, uh, cosmic, then lots of work gets created and papers get written, but it's not clear that enough change happens to be worth all the money it's spent. If you're too microscopic, then you tend to uh, lock into technologies and specific solutions to problems when the marketplace may be emerging that has better solutions mm -hmm. to those kinds of problems. So we're always you know, conscious of, is there a sweet spot here that we can aim for? And what is the fundamental problem we're trying to solve as opposed to what is the list of controls? So we think a lot about these fundamental problems and we've had to, you know, over the years and anyone who, who deals in security framework has to think about these things. So, um, you know, I, I started to really give that a lot of thought over the last couple versions of the controls. And um, yes, at the end of the day, we have a list, but the, I spent a lot of time on the introductory text, which I was trying to describe the sort of foundational problems and the, the things that we ought to be aware of independent of specific solutions. And that's hard to get right. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's uh, some in some cases we did better than in others, but that's where we're really thinking about it. Uh, you know, what is the so is visibility the challenge that we're trying to manage, or in the in the government you might call it situational awareness or something like that. Well, that can take many forms depending upon the technology of implementation, the way the business operates, and so forth. And that's what we need to see. You know, and are seeing when we shift our workforce to not being bounded by perimeter where I can't enforce a policy through a gate and a guard and a physical location of the device, then I have to think uh, more strategically and more uh, cleverly about this. And we, we've been doing this for years. Any, anyone in this business has, right? As we've moved to the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, as we've seen uh, IoT, as we see the emergence of 5G, 5G and much more virtualization of infrastructure, then we, we have to rethink all of these things that we ask for in security. That is, you know, they, they sort of don't apply. And you see the struggles of decision makers to try and bring things back to um, uh, 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 models or paradigms that, that, that make sense of them. Remember, I told the early days of government was about physical control. So I say I might have a requirement in the government thing that says, well, all of my data is only stored inside a, uh, a server that's on U.S. soil managed by U.S. citizens. You know, and so, OK, that, you know, maybe you can get away with that for a while. But, you know, the point of virtualization of cloud is to actually abstract some of these things away from you, right, for reasons of cost and scale and manageability. And so it, it's not clear that that you can sustain those kind of requirements or that that that's even the best solution to the problem. And so we, we constantly kind of chew on these sort of big problems. Yeah, I think there's a I mean, there, there's a bit of a, a, a language challenge there, too. So. You know, I tend to think of of a security control as, you know, an applied technology for some particular outcome. So, uh, you know, asset inventory, vulnerability assessment, change detection. A above that level, there's another sort of object, which I don't I don't have a good word for a collection of them. You might call a framework, but it's this this, um, you know, you could call it a security objective, maybe of visibility, uh, you know, of 
uh, identifying all your assets. These, these sort of timeless security needs that apply regardless of the technology or the environment. And for each different technology and environment, you might need a different tool to get to that objective. Is, is that, is there a language there that, that, that would be better to use or that CIS adopts? I'm not sure there is, Tim, but I think you're, you're onto something, you know, that, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, a challenge to think of defense and, and, and attack in a really systemic way or in a holistic way, right? At the end of the day, a phrase I use is that both security and insecurity are, in fancy language, emergent properties of the system, right? We're, we're used to thinking of a zero day in a piece of software, a flaw in a protocol, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you don't really understand the risk till you raise them up another level, right? To put them in the context of the system and the actions of humans and, you know, the composition problem of all these different pieces. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of discussion that we need to think more about, right? We're not going to build, uh, at least I don't think in my professional lifetime, sort of perfect security. We're not even going to build perfect pieces that, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be composing the best cases we're composing uh, pieces that have known properties, including flaws, that we can make up for in other parts of the system, right? In this language, you might call that uh, compensating controls. You know, again, it's still kind of at the technology level, but I think that's important. I think we always have to remember that the, the goal of any system is not to be secure. The objective of that system is not security. It's it's whatever its other, you know, mission is, if it's to process transactions or store data, Security is a is an attribute, not an objective. Exactly, and I think that's and and we're seeing I think over the last few years now, and we're still struggling as an industry through this. Uh, the uh, I'll call it the mainstreaming of cybersecurity, right away from this technology focus, wizardry focus. Uh, you know that that's gotten us a long way, right, to where we are today. But at the end of the day, as you said, you know this is about uh, uh, senior decision makers at every level making wise choices, right, with the best information that they have. And they're doing it in the context of not separate from the business, but in fact, an enabler of the business or a foundational to the operation of the business. And so, so you see, you know, everyone's in the business now, right? Uh, insurance companies, the legal system, auditors. I mean, everyone has entered this business at some level over the last few years. And, and again, um, it can be uncomfortable for those of us that grew up in technology, but it seems to be more in the right direction. You know, again, if you look at other examples of, of how society has uh, taken on high risk areas, then that's natural. We start to say we don't count on wizards to help us. We build we have building codes. We have laws. We have insurance to help us uh, transfer risk. You know, we have mechanisms that allow us to operate through these. And so so that's a healthy thing. Right. That's that's how we are able to operate in a, in a civilized way without asking everyone to become expert in all these. There's another angle I just wanted to mention about thinking about defense, though, and it's thinking about the attackers. I said earlier about if you if you treat the attacker as a magician, you have no defense. And you know, again, we have to be conscious of. Uh, you you hear the, the the bumper sticker, right? Is think like an attacker, and and okay, mm -hmm. I, I get that. You know that 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 makes sense. But uh, you know, people usually use that in the context of penetration testing or sort of sort of uh, specific focuses. But, yeah. I, but I think if you think about things like, again, having observed and lived with and, and uh, you know, really enjoyed the, the great company of professional attackers for much of my life, um, you know, they, again, they don't like to be seen. They have a, you know, they, they don't have an unlimited budget. It may seem like it. They have a boss, right? They have their own risk model that they have to, within, they have to operate. And they don't like uncertainty in particular. And so one of the things that makes uh, attacking so uh, lu uh, lucrative today is that, you know, it's, we're all sitting ducks, right? Our, our target is very static. People can study us. They, they know our infrastructure, our protocols. And, uh, you know, lots of great minds, uh, much smarter folks than me have been thinking for quite some years around things. You'll hear terms like moving target defense and so forth. But for me, you, you don't need to be, you don't need exotic technology. You have to realize that attackers have a model. And again, we're not building perfect defense. We're, we're thinking about the, the attributes of our business and we're thinking about the modeling of attackers and their objectives. And so people will have studied this through things like um, OODA loops, if that acronym rings a bell, mm -hmm. observe, orient, decide, act, right? The idea is we're, we're not, we're, there's not a binary win or not. We're manipulating these loops, you know, these loops of information. The attacker has to gather information, right? For example, about our topology or how are the transactions that move inside and outside of our network. And they're able to study that it's relatively static, 
And that information that they gather has very, very long value because it doesn't change, right? We don't change our topology overnight and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of thinking in the Defense Department and other areas over the years about, you know, I, I, I used to, I once proposed a thought piece uh, to, to a number of senior people at the Pentagon. I almost got laughed out of the room. I said, imagine the DOD as a nimble adopter of technology. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, you know, there are, there is reason to laugh, but the idea was, uh, a nimble adopter of technology is actually a, uh, has has lots of properties that you might associate with a hard target, right? Your the value of your reconnaissance as an attacker has a limited yeah. lifespan, and the idea was if we could take more actions under our control, you know, restart our servers, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 patch more nimbly, you know, reconfigure when we need to under different conditions then you actually cause a lot of cost and problem to the attacker. Yeah. And if they don't like that, and they often don't, then they have to find, they would probably prefer to find ways to attack you that have more permanence, for example, in your life cycle, right? Which mm -hmm. has different costs for them and different opportunities for the defender to observe and so forth. So anyway, so this uh, this whole business of, of thinking strategically, you're right, we need to kind of raise our sights above the level of, you know, do I have the right box or the right threat feed or the right thing? And how do I compose this in a much more uh, holistic way to think about defense? Now, an observation again is that most of this needs to be built in, right? Most enterprises, you know, can't hire the people and don't have the access to information to do this on their own. And, and again, as a matter of uh, social survival, we don't want everyone to figure this out on their own. We want to really make it easy for everyone to make these decisions well. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Now, back to your host, Tim Erlen. Yeah, that's interesting. You made me think of two things there. Um, one is that there's an interesting corollary between the concepts around usability and uh, thinking like a, a defender. So if you if you conceptualize your, your role as a defender as uh, creating the least usable environment for an attacker, that has some some interesting implications. Yeah, it does. That's a neat way to, to describe it too, Tim. And it, it then brought to mind the the I think it was Netflix that that introduced a homegrown tool called Chaos Monkey <laughs> that was designed basically to to cause chaos in their environment as a means to you know, in production, test their resilience, which also has a, a you know interesting implications there as well. Yeah, it does absolutely. Yeah, it's it's you know again, the attackers are uh, rational, right? They like to hide a noise, and um, but they like to have control of their own infrastructure, and so and the, they, they like having long term value of information they collect because it's you know, it's precious to collect it. So unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. I think we could have this conversation for, for a very long time. Uh, but I do want to wrap up with, with one question that's hopefully a practical one for um, security leaders. Uh, you know, there are security leaders today. We're all dealing with this, this shift to work from home with the uncertainty, uh, you know, involved in, in trying to run a business in a, in, a, in a pandemic. How can security frameworks like CIS be used by those security leaders um, in, this, in this time and environment? I think um, the... Uh, the key to that, and, and we're actually thinking this through from the framework creator side, or for CIS, we're, we're um, thinking about what a version eight. We're currently on the version seven point one, and and trying to reframe the way we think of this around many of the topics that you and I just discussed. Right? What's the what's the problem we're really trying to solve? What's the sort of more abstract way to think of it that's independent of technology? So we're really trying to make it easier from this side for uh, for people to adopt it. You know, we're not trying to create the best list. We're trying to create the most useful. Uh, security change. But I would say that for uh, uh, almost any, at a, at a core level, most frameworks call out a, a really, um, a, a, there's a high correlation among different frameworks when you look at them, right? This this business of cross mapping across frameworks mm -hmm. has become sort of a, a cottage industry ac across the entire uh, uh, ecosystem. So we're, we're trying to make it easy for folks. And we also, and I think we, we had uh, some joint surveys with Tripwire uh, in the not too far past, looking at this issue of 
you know, typical enterprises have to deal with multiple frameworks. And uh, just based on the business they're in, the geography they operate, the kind of information they handle and so forth. So, so we're, I, I think of it as we're in grave danger of bankrupting ourselves, you know, in this business of, of proving what we've done to multiple parties, whether they're frameworks mm. or regulators or, or lawyers or whoever. And so we collectively need to make that simpler. And so uh, what I would be looking for if I'm in the decision process, that was to, just to look for the steps that are in common, whether it's across, you know, our work or NIST or PCI or I said 27,000 or any of these, you know, there's a core set of things that we can help you from CIS find what we think is the core of those. Uh, there are commercial services that do this, but, you know, there, there's sort of goodness in this 80% thing, you know, that, that we all seem to have in common, that every framework, the, the problem is we all ask for it differently. Right. We, we like different words and different colors or whatever it is. And so we get my, my view is we have to make that simpler. But I, I, I would be looking for these things that we have in common. And at the, at the end of the day, for me, the most important ones are these foundational steps that bring you things like visibility, awareness, you know, um, uh, understanding of the security state of your of the pieces, whether it's patching or configuration or privilege management. You know, this has really been the core set of things that drive the controls. Uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think it's uh, common across many of the frameworks. So that's where I would begin, uh, you know, if I were trying to struggle with this, because it, it is overwhelming. I mean, the, the, you could spend the, the, the thousands of pages it takes uh, to, to keep up with this is just uh, not within reach for most folks. The, the last thing I'll mention, uh, Tim, is that we're, we're also uh, at CIS have made a conscious investment to, to bring our work together with other things like uh, the work that the Verizon data breach folks do, the MITRE attack model, and so forth, right? To to really bring together this uh, broad understanding and decomposition of what attackers do, and make a uh, really strong effort to map them into what defensive options we have to block or prevent, et cetera, the attackers at, at multiple stages in their life cycle. We think that is essential to both establishing the importance and the priority of controls, as well as uh, giving us a a way to kind of negotiate trust, right? How, how do I know if we're going to be in a business relationship together? How do I know that uh, if we agree on this is the common threat to our business, are we each taking the, the necessary steps to protect this this part of our business, uh, you know, so that we can have a, a high confidence in, in that uh, our success? Thank you so much, Tony. As always, an um, interesting conversation. I, I I really appreciate the experience and expertise and knowledge that that you have to share, and I think um, all the listeners do as well. Thank you very much, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and hopefully you'll tune back in for the next uh, edition of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Brought to you by Tripwire. Visit tripwire.com.